We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Today, I have to say, I'm really excited about this message as we're going through the book of Job, um, as uh, some have referred to as the book of Job. Um, But just so you know, it is the book of Job. Um, So uh, as we're diving in, you know, by the way, my name's uh, Pastor John. Um, I get the honor of basically being able to share this, this message this morning. And this message about Job, it, it's one that we don't want to miss. It's one that we don't want to miss because there's so much going on here that we might not see in our lives. But God, he kind of pulls back the veil and allows us to see things that we might not see otherwise. And as Pastor Matt talked about last week, if you've not heard the story of Job, Job was a righteous man. Job was someone who, when it came to uh, honoring God, he did, he went above and beyond. In the midst of this, Satan, as it says, is going to and fro throughout the earth. And God says, have you considered my servant Job. God counts this man as worthy of his name. Worthy of, listen, I think that he's the real deal. And Satan says, oh man, no, take everything away. And so he takes everything away because God allows him. The divine wager is set in motion. And Job refuses to curse God and die. As his his wife says after they've lost their children and their businesses, she says, curse God and die. And that's a whole other thing, okay? But within it, he doesn't. And Satan says, listen, fine, take away his health. And God says, fine, you can do everything, but you can't take his life. Now, in the life of Job... There's a a algebra of righteousness that we're going to talk about in a moment, but it's all about perspective. And I think about this morning, I was sitting in the back there before before any of the worship services, and as, as the worship team was practicing, I had this perspective, and this this table was down there, and as I was sitting down and looking at it, I couldn't see the top of this table. I literally was like, who who busted the table? Who took it off? And I thought, you know, well, I guess I can take my coffee and I can put it in the very middle and that's it. It's going to be an interesting morning. But the fact of the matter was there was a table there all along. And it wasn't until I got up and started walking up and I thought, oh, I guess there is a table. But within this, we're going to see some perspective. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. God Almighty, we come before you. We ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that you would help us to see what we can't see on our own that you would pull back the veil of heaven. Holy Spirit, we invite you here today. Jesus, we know that you have already made provision for all of this. So Father, help us to meet you where you are. Please meet us where we are. At the foot of the cross where the ground is level, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, as we are talking about this, Job's friends, we're gonna be talking about this morning. And the Bible says a lot about friendship. In fact, I wanted to just share a few words out of the Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 17, it says, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. Something that I'm certain Job needed at this moment. Proverbs 18, 24 says, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. They are closer than flesh and blood. They are there for these times. And again, Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. That's right. We need friends who will speak the truth to us in love. Who will, as it were, take a mirror and put it in front of us 
when we have not been looking closely enough. And Job, in the midst of all this suffering, in the midst of losing his, his family, in the midst of losing his businesses, in the midst of losing his health, what do people say as they get older? If you have your health, you have everything. He has nothing. And we pick up. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open to Job chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take the one in front of you, underneath the seat in front of you, and that's our gift to you, okay? Job, it's found right in the middle of the Bible. If you find Psalms, just go backwards a little and you'll find it. In Job chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, it says this. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he had suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust into the air over their heads to show their grief. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great. They see him and they're like, I don't even recognize this guy. In the book of Ruth, when Naomi has lost her husband and her two sons, she comes back home with Ruth. And the people who knew her many years ago, they're like, can this be Naomi? And Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. And the question as Job's friends come is, is he going to become bitter? Or is he going to become better? Now in this moment, they are silent. And I think that it's important to understand that uh, it's been said, and, and the proverb is true, even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent. That's right, if they keep silent. And they are silent for seven, year, seven days, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But as we're talking about listening, as we're talking about quietness and silence, I thought about a book that our staff has been going through. We've been going through this book, The Listening Life. And in this book, psych psychology professor David Benner says that a major obstacle to growth in our listening abilities is that most of us already think that we're good listeners. Think about it. How many times when we're talking with a friend, somebody that we, they really mean a lot to us. They're talking, and what are we thinking of? What can I say next? We're not really listening, are we? We're not listening with our, with our full hearts. We might even have our, our phone. And we're not on the phone, but if I had the phone in front of me, and I'm just kind of walking around and stuff like that, and you turn around and I'm like this, I'm not really listening, am I? Yeah. We need to be fully present. And in the midst of all of this, as, as we know what's going on in heaven for Job, we know about the divine wager, he doesn't know about it, and his friends don't know about it. And so the question becomes, what to do when heaven appears? Silent. What do we do when heaven appears silent? Well, the first thing is we need to be ready to listen. Be silent. When heaven is silent, be silent because we need to leave room to hear the music, to know what's really going on, to hear the Lord. And when we have friends who are going through this, we need to be silent. In Judaism, we're going to talk about, for a moment, sitting Shiva. In Judaism, sitting shiva means simply to sit in silence. When somebody has lost loved ones, you sit in silence and you don't speak until spoken to. And the time of shiva goes for seven days and they say so much. His friends say so much when they say nothing at all. But as we're looking at this, we have to remember that there is a divine wager going on. 
We need to know that Satan is at work. And, and while we read in the book of Job, everything that's happened up till now, and now his friends are talking, I personally think about Jesus. I think about Jesus when he was baptized. And we hear the Father from heaven say, this is my son, with him I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descends down on him like a dove and then leads him out into the wilderness to be tested for 40 days and 40 nights by the enemy as he is fasting. And the enemy turns and twists the words of God. And then at the end of the story, after Jesus has overcome, it says that the devil left until a more opportune time came. Now I hear of, of Satan and I think he left for a more opportune time to come. And I think, man, he's always been a liar, a thief. Like lying is his native tongue, twisting the scriptures. He knows how to do this. And so when I look at the story of Job, I think, liar, liar, liar. He wants to take things and it's not gonna be any different here. And I think about what is the conversation? Like, we don't have in the scriptures that Satan is actually talking during this time, but I don't think that he's just sitting still. And so I always kind of wonder, like, what else is going on in the heavenlies? And we don't know all the things that are happening in the heavenlies. Jesus even said, if I speak of earthly things and you don't understand, how am I ever going to speak about heavenly things? Amen? But we get to see what is going on in the heavens. And one of the things that's important to understand is that there is in Judaism at this time, an algebra of righteousness. Maybe you've seen this in the scriptures before. Now let me outline what this is. The algebra of righteousness is simply this. Do good, and good will happen to you. Do evil, and evil will happen to you. Therefore, bad things only happen to bad people. Good thing none of you are bad, right? But there is this algebra of righteousness one plus one equals two. The problem is the math problem isn't complete. Clearly just from using numbers because algebra always has all those X's and O's and all those letters, right? But within it, you have to understand what his friends are thinking about. You have to understand their, their construct, their structure of thinking within this. And we see this in Job 4.3, we see his, one of his friends comes to him, Eliphaz. He says, in the past, you have encouraged many people. You have strengthened those who were weak. Job, you've come alongside people. You know the algebra of righteousness. And he goes on in verse 6, and he says, doesn't your reverence for God give you confidence? Doesn't your life in, of integrity give you hope? If you've been so good, you shouldn't be worrying about any of this because you know how it works. But then he goes on in verse eight because he, he's ultimately saying, clearly you know, Job, that you did something wrong. Eliphaz says, my experience shows that those who plant trouble, Amal, and cultivate evil will harvest the same. This word amal, we're going to see, it's a, it's a Hebrew word that it's simply, it, it, when, when speaking of it, it simply means trouble, misery. If you have planted misery or trouble, guess what's going to happen? It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, maybe not for a few months, but eventually it's going to grow and there's going to be a harvest of that same fruit. Now in New Age and, and some other religions, they will talk about karma, okay? You get what you give. But there's so much more going on here. But this, as it were, this algebra of righteousness is what his friends are coming with because this is their understanding. And it's not completely wrong. Generally speaking, if you do bad at some point or another, it's probably gonna catch up to you, isn't it? But sometimes there's more going on than what our eyes can see. Galatians 6, 7, Paul, an early follower of Jesus, he says this, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You will always harvest what you plant. And so when we talk about these things, 
I only have a little bit of time, but I want you to know that there are three prayer blockers to be aware of. The first one is unconfessed sin. They're not wrong. If you've sinned, confess it to heaven. Confess it to heaven. Go to the Lord and say, hey, listen, I have sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against this person or these people. Please forgive me, God. Go and be reconciled, because that will be a prayer blocker otherwise. Another one is unresolved relational conflict. Now, I've taught on this in the past, many years ago, uh, going through 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter, Peter actually says, ladies, ladies, if your husbands are not treating you right, you can actually be the one who is blocking those prayers to heaven. Guys, they got some power, okay? They got some power, and it's one of those things that you can't treat your spouse, you can't treat your wife the wrong way and expect for heaven to bless you. In as much as each day, each Sunday, when we come together, we take communion. That communion isn't just to be right with God, it's to be right with one another. The scripture literally says, listen, if, if you have something against your brother or sister in Christ, don't take communion. Go, be reconciled. Go and be reconciled. Because that's going to come between not just you and your brother or sister in Christ, but you in heaven. Again, the third one, third prayer blocker would be selfishness. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says, uh, God says, um, you know, you come to me with fasting but then you're oppressing the poor. You're trying to get close to me and you're going to treat them poorly? Your actions are speaking so loud I can't hear what you're saying. When we look at these things, when we look at these prayer blockers and we look at the algebra of heaven, eventually Eliphaz he goes on in chapter 5 verse 7 he says people are born for trouble they're born for amal they're born for trouble for misery as readily as sparks fly up from a fire now I'm going to assume that all of us here in this room and over in the lounge and online we've all been before a fire at some point or another you get all your kindling and everything else right and as you do that Pour a little gas on there. Not a recommendation. I've done it. It's a bad idea. But sometimes you can't get it going. But you get it going, and what starts happening? Where there's smoke, there's fire. And, and the smark, smoke it starts to kindle, and, and the smoke starts to go, and eventually sparks fly. At some point or another, you, we love that crackling sound until we hear, and suddenly Something just came out at us, and maybe there's a little bit of fire on our toes, whatever it is. It goes up. It's going all over the place. And this is normative, and, and this is normal in life. And LFS says, yes, that's what life is like. This is the human condition. We are all, and this world included, we are ever bent towards evil. Now, some of you all know some people that you're like, listen, those people are bent in half. And some of y'all, we have come to the Lord, and he has done a great work. And I understand that. But we still struggle in a world that is bent away from heaven. There's a saying that um, many of us have, many of you have probably heard. We've, we've heard this saying, it is what it is. You ever heard that? It is what it is. I remember many years ago, we were in a tough spot. My, my relationship with my wife was great. With my family, it was fantastic. But we were in some tough times. And I was not always dealing with it well. And I said these words to my wife many times over. It is what it is. And she just wanted me to stop. But I didn't know how to express it any other way. It is what it is. This is, this is what we are dealing with. It's the human condition. We've all got our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. We all have those things that we need help from heaven. We need others to come alongside us as well. And then another friend of Job begins to speak up. In Job 8, 1 through 3, it says, Then Bildad, 
the Shuhite replied to Job, How long will you go on like this? You sound like a blustering wind. Does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? This is one of those places in Scripture you literally see that he, Job is being called a blowhard. You, listen, you're just like blowing in the wind. You know, you're just blowing wind. There's nothing of substance coming out, Job. You know how this works. You are setting yourself up against God. Are you saying, Job, that God is unjust? We know the altar of righteousness. We know how this works. And it's important to understand that theology matters. As my wife has said to me many times over the years, it's not what you say, but how you say it. I would also add to that, it's all about timing. There is a time and a place for saying things. You can be right and you can be so wrong. I think of my friend Sam many years ago. He's a, a chaplain. And many years ago, as a chaplain, there was a 16-year-old daughter who died, unfortunately. And as he was in that hospital room, trying to console the mother, the pastor came in and he put his hand on the daughter's feet and said, at least we know where she is. Was he right? Yeah, he was right in that moment. But he was so wrong. And that mom let him know. She didn't care where she was. She's not here. We can say the right theology at times and it can be the wrong time, or it can be we just expressed it in the wrong way. And it's no different. It's no different with Job's friends. Because this particular friend, and remember, these guys go back. In eight, Job 8 4, Bildad goes on and he says, Your children must have sinned against him. That's God. So their punishment was. Well deserved. Just as Bildad getting punched in the face is going to be well deserved in that moment. Amen? Amen. Seriously. Seriously. Oh my goodness. And he goes on and he says, But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. Thanks, Bildad. All of my kids are dead. You must be planning for the resurrection then, I guess. So what do you do when heaven appears silent and your friends are around you? Be ready to repent and be real. But it doesn't mean that you necessarily sinned either, does it? We know that Job did not sin. In fact, Job, Job would offer sacrifices up, not just for himself, just in case his kids had sinned, he offered up sacrifices for them just in case, because that's the kind of dad he was. And his friends knew that, and they have the audacity to say, well, you know, they deserved it. Why? Because in that moment, they're looking at the algebra of righteousness. They're looking and they're saying, this is what God's like. And so, this can't be, my interpretation of what's going on can't be wrong, so it must be you, Job. It must be you. Job eleven six. It says, if only he would tell you the secrets, ta alama, of wisdom. For true wisdom is not a simple matter. Listen, God is doubtlessly punishing you far less than you deserve. <sighs> I do not want any friends like this, okay? 
These guys, seriously, they just need punched in the face along the way or something like that because they just keep on bringing it. Now, are, it's, it's, is it true? Well, Psalm, Psalm 44, 21 says, God would surely have known it for he knows the secrets of every heart. Yes, God knows what's going on. You can't hide what's going on. God knows exactly what's going on. And yes, yes, Job's friend is correct. He uses this word, that true wisdom, that that the secrets of wisdom. Ultimately, listen, God knows what's going on. You might not even know what's going on. Maybe, Job, maybe you sinned and you're not even aware of your sins. In the Mosaic law, they would offer up sacrifices to heaven. In the midst of all of this, there was a sacrifice on behalf of Israel, specifically for sins that people weren't aware of. They weren't aware. Just as Job offered up on behalf of his kids sacrifices, because they might not be aware. And so, Job's friend is saying, listen, just go to God. Maybe, maybe, you just need to confess, and you need to seek out God. Maybe you need to be like the psalmist in Psalm 139. Search me and know me, God, and see if there's any offensive way in me. If there's anything between you and me, God, I want to know what it is so I can make that wrong right. Theologically sound. But then to follow it up with, clearly you desire, deserve worse, Job. I lost my kids. I lost my jobs, all my businesses, I've lost my health, and you think I deserve worse? Oh. Well, here's the good news. Eventually, Job begins to respond. Now, we don't have a lot of time to talk today about that response, but what I will say is Pastor Matt's going to talk more about it next week. But I will say in Job 16.1, it says, Then Job spoke again, I have heard all this before. What miserable Amal comforters you are. You want to talk about Amal? I can talk about Amal. You think I'm bad? Y'all are much worse, right? We kind of, he, he has that come to Jesus moment with them. But in the midst of this, going back to Job 9, verse 33, I love this. Job also says, if only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I cannot do that in my own strength. The truth is, God is not beating him though, right? He doesn't know this, but he is crying out for a mediator. Someone who can stand in the gap. Now we know the full story, but in the midst of this, he's crying out for a mediator, and that mediator would have been known as a daysman. It's the idea of acting as an umpire. Now I have a little bit of baseball in the brain because it's spring training, go O's. But in the midst of this, in the midst of it, it's the idea of an outside party You've got one party here, one party here. He said, she said, or he said, he said, she said. Because listen, we got brothers in Christ here that will fight back and forth. Sisters in Christ go back and forth. You can look in the book of Philippians. There were two sisters in Christ who were going back and forth there. But you can have it in a marriage. You can have it in a family. You can have it at work, whatever it is. Sometimes we need a mediator. And in this case, Job is saying, I need a mediator between me and God. And this is what I would call and it's been known as a Christ key. This is a place in the scriptures and the Old Testament that is looking to Jesus, the mediator between God and humanity. Again, what do we do when heaven appears silent? And I think it's important to understand, be ready to release it to God. Believe. Believe the unbelievable. I heard this recently at, uh, uh, from a, another minister online. The idea that we believe in prayers, pills, and provision. Let me explain. 
When something's going on here, we're going to first resort to prayer. We're going to go before the Lord and we're going to say, God, I need your help. I need your help. That, that, that should be proactive prayer even. But we're going to start out with just meeting with God together. If you're in a, a life group, we're going to pray together. But at the end of the day, we're going to give it to God. But listen, if we're struggling, let's say that you have the big C or you are dealing with depression or you're dealing with something else and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. Sometimes we're going to also say, you know what? Maybe you need to go and get some of that medication from the doctor. Maybe you need to go to a counselor. Maybe you have to get the chemo or whatever it is. Maybe there's some changes that need to take place. And that doesn't mean that we're not living by faith. Provision is simply saying, listen, God, I am coming to you. You are the provider in all of this. And I'm going to submit myself to you. I'm going to trust you, God. And regardless of the outcome, I'll still worship you. Because you're worthy regardless of my circumstances. You are worthy because of who you are. And I know that at some point or another, you're going to make all these things right. I know that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. I know it's an already but not yet kingdom. And that I am just waiting for you, Jesus more and more and more each and every single day. And so it's important within this that we understand that, listen, when somebody is going through difficulty, whatever it is, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, when we say, listen, maybe you have sin in your life, that's a possibility. We need to examine ourselves. It may be, hey, we need to have some faith. But what we don't want to do is say, well, it's either you have sin in your life or you lack faith. It could not be anything else. And the book of Job really takes the veil off of all of this to recognize, listen, sometimes there is more going on than what we see with our eyes. Sometimes God is using this in ways that we don't even know. But God has not abandoned us. So I want to share with you very quickly three myths of the algebra of righteousness. The first one, the first myth is God only blesses good people. In Matthew 5, Jesus says that God reigns on the righteous and the unrighteous. He brings sunlight on the righteous and the unrighteous. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to get things right. The second myth, only evil people suffer. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Those must be some bad people. And Jesus says, what are you talking about? They're worshiping God. You think that they're worse? What? No. Only evil people suffer? No. There is sin in this world. We are ever bent towards evil. It is what it is. Take how you will in this. The third myth of the algebra of righteousness is this. Suffering always has someone to blame. We love the blame game, don't we? I want to know why. Yes, we all want to know why. I'm, I'm there with you. There are things in this world that I don't always get. I don't always hear the why. And so sometimes we can be, we can be like the people who ask Jesus. Who sinned that this man was born blind? Did he sin? Or his parents? And I can't imagine what that had to have been like. You're telling me that you think that somehow or this, this man, when he was in the womb, sinned against heaven, and that's why he was born blind? Or his parents must have sinned, and that's why? And Jesus says, no. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. 
Isn't that the story of Job? This is all happening in order that the power of God might be seen. We need to trust the one that we trust our salvation to, the one that we come to at the foot of the cross for the forgiveness of sins. We have to trust that in the economy of God, he knows what he's doing. We've done everything on our part, and at the end of the day, we just have to trust him. So hear this very clearly. If you hear nothing else this morning, I want you to hear this. In our waiting, God is working. In our waiting, God is working. And so this morning, when we come to our what now God moment, it's very simple. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Whether you are going through it or someone else is, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Second, be humble. Repent if needed. That is, turn away from your sin if that's the issue. Third, be prayerful. Release it to God. Be ready to release it to God. And as we come into this next song, as we close out this service, I want to encourage you. You might not have the words. Let this song be the words as you connect with the God of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We know that you are a gracious God. And we submit to you. We place ourselves at your feet. We thank you for the example of Job. We thank you that you are a God who counts us worthy in Jesus. Father, please forgive us of our sins. Please bring healing emotionally, physically, spiritually. Bring healing and Lord, bring provision. And we trust you in this moment and into eternity. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.